I cannot believe that we're already in the back half of 2024. Are you kidding me? But here we are. Before you know it, the calendar will be turning again. And that means we are already getting ready for 2025 conferences. And one that I'm personally very excited to attend again is the Insights EDU conference. If you care at all about growing enrollment and building a student-centered higher ed experience, you really should be at this conference. Registration is now open, so secure your spot while early bird pricing is still available. Visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. That's visit insightsedu.com for more information and to register. Hey, everybody. This is Ilvin Freitas, co-founder of the EdUp Experience. And today, we are extremely excited to announce our paid subscription service. By subscribing today, you will get exclusive early access to ad-free episodes, extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content. That's right, original content and invites to special events, all while helping to sustain EdUp. To become a subscriber, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com and subscribe to our free email newsletter to learn how you can get access. Again, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com. Welcome back, everybody. It's your time to ed up on the Edup Experience podcast where we make education your business. This is Dr. Joe Lustio back with you on another episode here at Edup as we continue to record these episodes in one of the most variable times in higher education. If you've been reading the news today, um, and today will be two to three weeks for the, those of you that listen to this episode, but still, I don't think the theme will change. We have people that say um, they're losing confidence in higher education. We have others that say higher education still has value. Get that college degree. Um, there's ROI. And uh, uh, tailoring a degree to have some kind of return on investment. Then there's uh, others that say a college degree goes beyond ROI, but we're not doing a very good job of telling that story, in my opinion, um, of what else is valuable within that degree, right? Because we have skill definition, we have all of these things we have to do in higher education. And, and again, this is my opinion, my soapbox moment. We sometimes wait in higher ed for our colleagues to do something about it before we try to do something about it. We're the ultimate wait and see industry. We have to stand up and say the work that we do is good and noble and it's changing lives every single day and, and dis, um, mantle, dismantle some of the narrative out there that uh, higher education is somehow not valuable in our society. And can you imagine a society where we have less, a less educated population? When we see those moments happen, you go, oh God, higher education is going to be the thing that solves that. So that's the stance we take here at the Edup Experience podcast. And I, I believe I have individuals with me that feel similar to that. Let's get them in one at a time right now. Ladies and gentlemen, first, he's Ron Marshall. He is the president at LIM College. Ron, how are you? I'm great. I'm great. Yourself? Oh, it's another day in paradise for me, Ron. Another <laughs> day in paradise. I get to talk to you, man. What else could there be that's going to make my day better than this? So, no, I mean, you know, high bar. I can't think of anything. <laughs> you you got to come through now. And, and our second guest, ladies and gentlemen, he's Dr. Scott Carnes. He is provost at LIM College, and they're in the same room. So this is one of those unique moments. What's up? How are you, Scott? I am very well. Pleased to be here today. Well, so, Ron, why don't you start first? We always like with our audience to just level set for us. Tell us about LIM College. What do you do? How do you do it? Who do you serve? Great, great. So LIM College just celebrated its 85th anniversary. Uh, We're an institution here in New York City that specializes in the education of the business of fashion. And we like to pride ourselves that we deliver superior outcomes to our students, our alumni, and the industry. And I'm sure as we'll go through the session, we'll talk about all the ways that we can add that sort of value. But, you know, we believe that it's about focusing solely on the business of fashion and lifestyle. It's about experiential learning, which was uh, really the foundational element of the school 85 years ago. You know, we're here in the in the center of the fashion world on Fifth Avenue that we, as I said before, we have superior 
alumni outcomes for an organization. And when we say, when we say that, we're talking about 97% of our graduates are working in their field of study within six months of graduation. Amazing. Scott, um, Ron doubled down twice and said the business of fashion. Tell me exactly what that means and why that stress point. Well, because I think when most people think about fashion, they think about the glitz and glamour of fashion design. But the harsh reality is not everyone will make it as a designer, but there is a vast field in the fashion industry with many, many employable opportunities for people that have that passion for fashion. So we're talking about programs in marketing, in merchandising, in supply chain management, in uh, media, fashion media, um, all these different aspects of the fashion industry that a lot of people don't necessarily think of when they think of fashion and retail, but it really is what drives the industry is the business side of it. So is the is the um, part that you would expect, like when you say fashion, you're thinking, oh, designers, I'm going to design this, design that. That's maybe the smaller, that's the output of all the other stuff around it, right? So there's this large ecosystem of jobs that surrounds a designer to get to this textile, right? Absolutely. All the stores that you walk into have an army of folks that do planning and buying and sourcing, managing, getting that product from the designer into the store and into the hands of the consumer. And there's many, many different roles that folks can play in that space. I mean, there's an ecosystem surrounding fashion from uh, the editorial side, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I mean, increasingly our students are becoming influencers. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. That we'll talk about that because that's got to yeah. be that's we also be talk one of about, the fastest growing areas, right? Yeah, absolutely. We also talk about lifestyle. Fashion extends into music, into sports, into all these other fields and industries where our students are working and have influence as well, based on their work in the fashion space. Yeah, in fact, um, roughly fifty percent of our graduates are in jobs that would be considered to be in a lifestyle industry and and our uh, valedictorian this year was doing her final co-op with the country music awards in nashville we have a student who's interning with nascar right now down in the carolinas excellent we like to hear the stuff like that right because uh you know i think there's a with it with anything there's education within education you yes. think about the fashion industry, you 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 probably, and this is a guess, um, an assumption that you have to almost educate some of your interested students in in that ecosystem because they may, many might come in thinking that it's one thing, and then you have to open their eyes up to all the other things, right? Or 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 do the students just come in going, "Oh, I want to be a, a lifestyle fashion reporter." <laughs> Are they that specific, you know? Well, we do We do have students who walk through the door with very clear visions about what the industry is about and uh, how they want to fit in to that ecosystem. But it's important as an incoming first-year student that you don't, we don't uh, allow them to choose a major. They need to go through a sort of immersion, including an internship, before they start making that decision. And then, and then, of course, you know, there are many exit points where you can leave one discipline and go into another during your four-year experience. You know, that's a, that, that brings up a, a, inter, a really specific set of questions. Now, as somebody who's worked in higher ed for 23 years, myself, actually, you know what? I took a sidestep. Now I work in ed tech, but we could have that conversation later. Um, I the hardest population to retain at first was the undecided student. And many institutions push you, push you really, really hard to declare a major because somehow that funnels you into this different or um, more specific structure of support, right? Because now you're associated with this faculty, with this advisor, with this stuff. But if you didn't pick a major, you wouldn't have access to those resources. Can you talk a little bit about the structural changes that you have that allow you to have that student move through without picking that major and how they can access the same level of resource? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it starts with us having a specific focus in fashion. So they already have a shared interest. We are designed 
to expose them to the breadth of what that means. That is coupled with a first year freshman course that they take a first year experience course that really is meant to help guide them through that exploration, make sure that they're taking full advantage of the opportunity that they have through their classwork, through exposure to the industry, through guest speakers that we're bringing in. We also have them participate in their first of three required internships in that first year. And there's a course that sets them up for that process. So we want to get them experience in the industry right away so that they can begin to determine, is this aspect of the field where I want to go? Or should I be looking elsewhere before I declare that major at the beginning of my first year? So they've got advising support. They've got faculty support through that first year experience. And they've got career and internship services support helping them make that first entry into the marketplace. That's good to know the three internship piece, right? I mean, it's the it truly experiential learning to get in, intern, feel the burn a little bit, look yeah. at the industry, what's <laughs> happening. Um, because this is a, you know, maybe the better question, the foundational question I want to ask before I get to that is, Tell me about the education itself a little bit. Are we online, on ground, mixed? What's the demand? Yes, all. Yes. Like? yes, all. Yes, all. Yes. We, we do have um, a core of our students that are traditional, come to campus, take all their classes in person. But we've got probably a good third of our students that are online only. And then students have the opportunity to mix and match as needed. As you can imagine, living in New York is very busy and People are commuting and working with the internship burden that, that we put on them as well. They have a lot to manage. So that flexibility and being able to determine when to take an on-ground course on campus and an online course is really helpful for students. Yeah. And, and, and while, yeah. well, the majority of our students come from the Northeastern U.S., uh, yeah. it is truly a national and international student body. And in fact, uh, this incoming class we're confident saying it's yeah. going to be the largest uh, international class that we've ever had. Yeah. Epic. Um, there aren't too many institutions putting largest and incoming class and putting those words together right now because of FAFSA. Um, because of, <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's a really interesting. I don't hear that too often. It doesn't matter what kind of student type they're talking about. Largest and incoming class. Those words aren't going together. It's more like, um, expense reduction, um, fuzzy math around the incoming class. We're not sure. We can't tell. What have you guys been doing um, at LIM to bring, so, maybe maybe to crystallize that incoming class in a way that, that helps you see it? Let me, let, let me take a, a shot first, and then Scott, please, yeah. please weigh in on this. I think there are a variety of things that we've done, one of which actually goes back to our core mission. I mean, we have uh, an exceptional reputation in the industry. So being able to deliver results to students, we believe over time is, is, is going to pay out, if you will. But I, I think that we've been very, very careful over the past couple of years to diversify our student intake. So we've dedicated quite a bit of resource to online. Clearly, we've de dedicated a lot of resource to international recruitment and then balancing that out I think is going to keep us in, in good stead going forward. Yeah, absolutely. We've also made some curricular changes, recognizing that the international population is growing and there are ways we can make ourselves more attractive to them. So with our master's programs, for instance, we've gone through a process of converting them all to having a STEM designation, which really ties into that, pra that practical experience that we want students to have in that work experience. Because when they come and they do their CPT, they typically have about a year of OPT available to them following graduation. Having participated in a STEM degree, they're eligible for up to 24 additional months. For the, for the listeners, Scott, who don't, aren't familiar with the OPT, CPT. Yes, thank you. No one's going to ask. I know what it is, but not everybody does. Yes. A curricular practical training. I, I make him do it for me. Yeah. <laughs> curricular practical training, or CPT, is the work that students, uh, is the opportunity that international students have to work while going to school. It well, has I need to, you to turn that provost down just a little bit, Scott. Turn down yeah. the provost. In, you know. <laughs> so it's an opportunity for international students to get work experience while they're in school. It has to tie to their curriculum in a very clear way. 
which is why it's the um, practical training component of that. OPT is the um, occupational training that they can do afterwards. So once they've completed their degree, they can participate in work for up to 12 months following graduation. And again, with the STEM designation, that gives them an additional 24 months. So they could have 36 months of work experience here before deciding to stay or take that experience back home with them. That's a fact. That's a fact. I love that you're hitting all the facts. It's perfect. Um, I, what, when I'm talking to other colleges, and which I do, by the way, I do this every day at noon central. I record a podcast. I've been doing that for a couple of years. Um, the differentiation piece is coming up a lot for, for colleges in general, right? Um, all homogenized, offering the same stuff. Um, you know, it's really hard to stand out in a crowd. But LIM, you have a niche. You have a specific audience. You have a – you're at the center of the universe. New York City is the center of the universe, isn't it? I mean, you're yeah. at the center of the universe. That, that matters in hard years, that reputational piece, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it clearly does. And I think the results demonstrate that. Yeah. And it's it's a place people want to be. It's a place where the industry is is at its most active and our connection to that industry is what drives and those, no, the, if, those outcomes. If you can't have fun in, the, in this industry, <laughs> then you just can't have fun. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a great place to be. And, you know, they have, they have many touch points. Obviously, the internships and the cooperative experiences are important touch points. Uh, our fashion show, we consider to be a tentpole event uh, for, the, uh, uh, for the institution, actually for the industry, where now, while we don't do a lot of design work, you know, there, there are a lot of designers in New York City. And our fashion show is dedicated to, uh, you know, turning a spotlight on the new up-and-coming designers in the city. Now, Ron, just an interesting tidbit about you, that you didn't grow up wanting to be a higher ed president. I mean, I don't think there is any uh, pre president in higher education. Does anyone grow up wanting to be higher ed? <laughs> no, I, I wanted to grow up in the shortstop for the Yankees. But, yeah, there you go. But, you know, it, it, I, I, got a lot of, I got a lot of feedback around that career choice early in my life <laughs> and decided to do something else. I, love, I, right? I, I actually come from the trade. Yeah, so I saw you had a big background in retail and in other areas. How did you get to this point where you said, you know what, I'm going to go run an institution? And or, or or what were the circumstances around it? Calling all higher ed marketing and enrollment management professionals. Here, here. The Insights EDU conference is back. This is your chance to level up your marketing and enrollment management strategies, and the EdUp Experience podcast will be there once again. Join us at the Ritz-Carlton, New Orleans, February 12th through 14th, for an unforgettable conference, registration is now open with early bird pricing. Outstanding. Hey, everybody. This is Ovin Freitas, co-founder of the EdUp Experience. Are you enjoying the conversation so far? Good. I hope so. Did you know that you can actually hear this conversation early before anybody else and ad-free so you don't have to hear my voice during these ads? And did you also know that you could get extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content. That's right. Original content and invites to special events all while helping to sustain EdUp. Well, if you didn't know, now you know. So go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com and become a subscriber today. First, you got to sign up to our free email newsletter and then you'll find out how to become a subscriber. Again, go to edupexperience.com. Well, um, I, I, I like to, well, you're right. I, I have a long uh, career in retailing. And most recently, I was the, uh, the CEO of Claire Stores, uh, which w was wonderful training for this job because uh, we think of Claire's as being the, uh, uh, being the little store in the mall that pierces ears. And it's that, but only about half of Claire's businesses in the U.S., uh, the other app is distributed globally. We had 250 stores in Japan, uh, several thousand stores in Europe, Africa, Australia. And uh, unlike a lot of retailers, we had our own supply chain uh, that was based out of a supply chain organization based out of Hong Kong. So all the elements that we teach here as a practitioner, 
I grew up with. Um, I actually like to tell people that I got this job the old fashioned way through nepotism. <laughs> uh, I love that. I, I, I am um, the, uh, I'm married to the oldest of the three granddaughters, the founder, uh, Maxwell Marcuse. And I uh, like it is. <laughs> and I had never really um, thought about doing this as a, as a career option, uh, but we had sold Claire's uh, to another private equity buyer. Uh, we're at the point where um, the third CEO, and the school's o- school only had three CEOs or presidents for 85 years, and I'm, I'm the fourth. Mm. So um, we, they felt that they wanted to make a change. Uh, I was newly unemployed, and they asked if I'd give it a go. And i got to be frank with you, um, it's wonderful. It's just absolutely wonderful. And the, the skills that I've developed over, over the course of the past X decades, um, I, I think, have some applicability here. Because certainly I have a view on what I want the end product to look like, what I want a fully formed LIM alumni, alumnus to look like. Yeah, and, you know, I'm interested to hear your thoughts really quickly on, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but a lot of times when we have executives coming into higher education at a presidential level from another industry, they bring in this business perspective into higher ed that, well, it is a business and there are certain parts of it that have to run exactly like any other business would run. And then there are some unique parts that, but in the end, the goals are similar. What's your take on, on that? Because there is a contingent of folks in higher ed that just believe that it, it should not be run like a business or that you can't even say those words. Don't say business, don't say sales, don't say those things um, because they don't exist in higher ed. Well, every, every organization has the same sort of considerations about cash flow, revenue streams, product development. In this particular case, our product are our students. And LIM traditionally, and will continue as long as I'm associated with it, will have the highest commitment to quality. You know, creating uh, graduates who have the critical thinking skills, who have the maturity, who have the discipline to be successful in the industry. Now, Scott, what, what interesting about you is you came from the City University of Seattle. Yes. And, um, a big school, bigger, it was, it was mid-sized school, but big association. Um, yes. As part of a system, um, has system stuff tied to it, and then you come into a, a, a more specific type school. What are some of the takeaways? What are some of the things that you brought from a bigger environment system-wide to a smaller environment with a niche, uh, more niche audience? Well, I think there's some efficiencies in organization that, that you can realize. Um, one, I had been at the art institutes prior to yeah. city university as well. So coming here was sort of a mix of that business at city university and the arts at, at the art Institute. Uh, but they were both system-based and some of the things that we've looked at here are curriculum management, assessment on outcomes, um, trying to systematize and centralize some of those functions so that your deans and your program chairs aren't all having to invent their own processes and ways of managing those and their faculty, right? So as much as we can centralize some of those processes it ensures consistency for us as an institution. It also eases the burden on my academic staff who, you know, we hear all the time how burdened academic staff are. Um, mostly from academic staff. Mostly from academic staff. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 100%. <laughs> you know, so if we can systematize some of those things, provide resources and tools for them that make that easier. That's, that's some of the thinking and practice that I think I brought from those larger institutions. Yeah. Art institutes was huge at one point. I mean, just as a system, I mean, they had, I don't remember how many students they had, but you were talking about a massive major, major system within the United States. Absolutely. Um, 
and and over time as the as the industry itself fashion arts design all those things I, I would say it's shrunk a little bit nationwide but also gotten much more specific and schools who are really really good are continuing to be really really good at those types of things can you talk about interest generation a little bit you know you said um, uh, Ron you said the Northeast typically are you are those natural hubs where students know about you or the specific cities that you're marketing to? Have you thought about going to California? There's just no interest there, right? Because of LA and its market and so on. Well, go ahead. Yeah. I, I was going to say Northeast is a natural for us, but we also see a lot of students coming out of Florida, Texas, California is, is one of the places that we see the shakeup with um, fit down there in California has certainly been um, a, player in the space. So I do think we have interests nationwide, um, I, but simply based on location, Northeast is the natural. I think that's right. Um, it, it brings up the question too of, of um, you know, location. You know, you see a lot of states where people are moving. They're moving out of those states. New York State has been one where yeah. people are migrating. They're migrating out of the state. They're going down to to Florida, they're, you know, going to the cost of living becomes an issue, you know, to be in New York city, to come to New York city, how do you keep that talent? Maybe it's natural. Maybe it's, you can't work in this industry really, unless you're in New York city or some other major city, but are you seeing, is the industry itself moving to remote work to, you know, to more flexible work environments um, in the business of fashion? You know, I, I think our industry is following the, national and, and really international trends about remote work. So that's going, that's going to be there regardless. Uh, but if you're going to be in the fashion industry, you have to be here. I mean, if you, if you want to be a movie star, move to LA. Okay. If you, if you want, if you want to be a honcho in the fashion industry, move to New York, this is where it's happening. And I think our students appreciate that. Not only our national students, but the international students. Exactly. Uh, it, you know, one of the biggest, uh, draws for LIM is to be in New York City. Who wouldn't want to be in New York City? Our, our, uh, our residence halls are catacornered to the Waldorf Astoria. Mm. How cool is that? That's pretty cool. Is, is, that, is, is the physical location to, as big of a draw as, as anything else? I mean, because you're, you want to be at the epicenter of, of where the work is done, right? Yeah, I, I, I think it is. I think the other aspect of the, this industry is that there is a return to brick and mortar. People want to be in stores. A fashion show is a live event. You have to be there in person where that is happening. And so showing up every day and participating is as much preparing you for that aspect of the industry as anything else. And particularly, particularly these cohorts of students. I mean, these were students who were, who were isolated during covid and I think the opportunity to re-engage with their colleagues and develop those relationships is an important part of an educational experience for them. Absolutely. I was going to ask that because I, I know from my niece is an example. She was in high school during COVID, ninth, 10th, 11th grade, whatever. And then she gets to go um, uh, off uh, for her for her undergrad. And it, foundationally, she says, I have to ha I want to go to class. I, yeah. So it almost, I don't want to say it soured online learning to a degree, but it made kids who you would think would naturally move to online learning because of its flexibility say, no, I, I want to be among my peers and having this relationship. Have you seen that amongst recruits too, to say, Hey, look, I want to be, especially international students, right? They, I, I have found in recruiting international students that they really want to be immersed in the culture, seeing people, talking to them, being in the classroom, rubbing elbows in the hallway, that kind of stuff. What have, what have you guys seen taken away? Yeah, we've, we've definitely seen that, that desire on the part of students asking for more in-person. Our last student satisfaction survey results pointed very clearly to the desire for more in-ground, in-person courses. I was just this morning having a conversation about opening more in-person sections because the incoming students want those. Although having having a, a vibrant online cohort is very important to us as well. Critical. There there are students that uh, just don't have the luxury of uprooting, moving to New York, dedicating themselves on a full time basis. You know, our our online students, both graduate and undergraduate, tend to mirror you know a, a national profile yeah. 
they're a little older, uh, they've got commitments in their lives. So this is the best way for them to pursue their education. Yeah. And we're, re we're really, really proud of the work that we've done there. Uh, in fact, there are, there are a series of, you know, follow up on this, Scott, there are a series of contests that uh, retailers and, and uh, retail foundations sponsor. And one is the uh, National Retail Federation contest in January. And one of the five finalists was an LIM online student which I mean, awesome. for me, for me validates what we're doing as much as anything. Yeah. I mean, I mean, online students are fantastic, but they do have a lot going on in their lives. So to see online students engage at that level is not something that you normally see. So to see the degree to which our online students are engaged and participatory and still having that connection to industry and taking advantage of mentorship and all the other opportunities that students have here is really gratifying and we think says that what we're doing online is working. And, and we're, you know, obviously we're a school that, that's sort of a high touch yeah. institution and, and believe in building relationships and believe in building um, alliances across, you know, industries and, and the having, uh, having online students trying to make them as engaged as an in-person student is, is core to what we're trying to do. Yeah. And that, that is actually a real challenge. It is a real challenge um, that I think every institution faces is how do you create community yeah. uh, amongst online students to the, to the point where you do when you put 20 people in a, uh, in a, in a classroom and they're talking and, you know, how do you create that same level of engagement for an online student to your point, who's busy, perhaps has kids at home, got to get them to school, got to do all these other things. Um, and that's something that I know that all communities struggle with is, is that level of engagement. Can you yeah. guys talk? Can, go, go ahead, Scott. Do you have anything? Well, you I was just going to go back to our, our points about the pandemic earlier and some of the learning that we've gotten from students, again, from that satisfaction survey was those online students said to us, we did a great job during the pandemic of streaming activities and club events and all those types of things. And we just naturally sort of backed off for those after the pandemic subsided and we're going back to those things now this this academic year we're streaming a lot more things for students and providing more opportunity for those who can't make it to campus every day to participate you know uh, ron something you just said about partnerships just kind of got my wheels turning a little bit and how tied to the industry you would want to be or probably are in terms of partnerships to create those pipelines to jobs for the students right Probably because the industry, I don't want to say it's a small industry, but it's probably a very specific industry. You know, which providers are doing which things on a big scale. Can you talk about how you maintain um, uh, relationships, public-private partnerships, that whole deal in the area? Sure. And, and I, I think there are some things that we've done uh, that have really been exceptional in terms of uh, reaching out to alumni, reaching out to people in the industry um, who um, really want to be engaged with our students. And the internship program is, is critical in doing that. I would say that we don't have the level of awareness in the C-suite that we deserve to have. And one of my key initiatives over the next several years is, is to create those relationships because I see those as being the guiding relationships as we adjust and as we change curricula, as we you know adjust our graduate programs, what are they looking for? We're, you know the old overused adage about you know from Wayne Gretzky about you know skating to where the puck's going to be. I have confidence that if they tell us where the puck's going to be, we can skate there. So. I think we've done a very good job in the past of, of connecting at a very granular, very personal level. I think we need to do a much better job going forward in connecting into the C-suite. So, you know, among the outreaches that we have, uh, Women's Wear Daily has an annual uh, re retail CEO conference. And for the first time, we're not only attending, but we're a sponsor, we're a co-sponsor to help elevate that awareness. I like that. I think that's great, right? There's so much um, activity that can happen at a ground level, referrals, you know, so and so and so and so. But when you elevate that to to a C-suite level, that's where you really create recognition. And, and you know, one of the most remarkable things, and, and it's overlooked, that if you, if I want to get a CEO involved with LIM, have them teach a class. They're so jazzed by that. 
that's yeah. so rewarding for them that they immediately open up. So it's just getting them here, having them meet our students, having them engage yeah. uh, is, you know, 90% of the effort. It's the next best thing to undercover boss for a CEO is to go teach a class. Because that, that yes. class will tell them exactly what's going on in the industry, right? Exactly, exactly. Scott, to, to you, um, one thing I do know a, a little bit about um, some of the trends in fashion from other um, art institutions and in, in places that I've interviewed over uh, the course of this podcast in the country and so on, is the focus on sustainability, fashion sustainability, um, you know, uh, uh, environmental friendly clothing I and mean, all of these bits. And so, and I found and heard that students come in, the students that are coming in new have a, a much um, greater focus on sustainability as a sort of foundational passion to choosing where they go to school or the the program they want to go into or the outcome that they want to have where maybe students in the past weren't as uh, passionate about those things or maybe not as overtly passionate about them. Can you talk about that shift um, in the Gen Z and, and younger? Yeah, I think they are definitely much more um, activists in that area than than previous generations of students. Um, and we, we certainly see it in our students. They're passionate about the idea of sustainability. It's a hot topic in fashion. Uh, we are working closely with our advisory board to ensure that we're incorporating the appropriate components into the curriculum so they're prepared to meet not only the current demands for the industry, but to Ron's point about skating where the puck is, the industry is headed in some very different directions and students will need to be prepared for that when it comes. Europe is way ahead of us in terms of regulatory requirements for the industry, but we will follow here in the States and we're, we're already starting to see that have impact on businesses. So it's certainly a part of our curriculum. It's a passion for our students. We have a student led club in sustainability that, um, you know, does activist work, but also hosts clothes mending workshops so that you can fix your clothes instead of go buying new ones, right? So they're thinking about this in a very broad way. And we are trying to ensure that we're supporting that in the curriculum and providing opportunity for them to put it into practice. Uh, that's what it's all about. Um, what do you, what do you have eyes on? in terms of what's next for LIM, Ron, maybe to, to you uh, first, where do you go from here? You know, you get through this incoming class, it's better than you thought it would be. What are those longer term goals you have for college? Well, certainly I think um, broadening out the student cohorts we have, uh, having much more of an international focus. And we believe that, that over time we can enhance our position as a global brand uh, but you really can't do that unless you have an international student base. Uh, we think that uh, there is a tremendous opportunity to provide in-house training and learning uh, for fashion houses, for retailers. Uh, oh, that's interesting. Like certificate-based training or non-credit skills-based? It, it, it can be stackable. It can yeah. be credential. Or it can be badges. It, yeah. it, any, of, any of the above. But our view is that it would be bespoke to the individual company. You know, once, once upon a time, the training programs that Macy's had or, um, or, or even uh, American stores Albertsons had out West were just outstanding, outstanding programs. And all of those, pro many of those programs, if they aren't gone, have certainly been diminished in size. And, mo and, and actually, frankly, mostly from guys like me, you know, <laughs> you know who, who, are look, who are looking to make a quarter and uh, try to find a line to cut to, to cut those expenses. I think that's a huge opportunity for us. And I think that's one of the benefits, one of the avenues that's going to up and up once we have that greater uh, C-suite involvement. Yeah, I think, I think you're right. How about you, Scott? What, what, at least from a, maybe a curricular standpoint or teaching and learning, what's, what's, what do you have eyes on for the future? Uh, there's really sort of three curricular areas that we're looking at for development, sustainability, as we just discussed, is one of the three. It's a huge area with a lot of change coming down the road for fashion. Uh, diversity, there's a 
pronounced lack of diversity and leadership in the industry. We have an exceptionally diverse student body. So we're really looking to position them to take on leadership roles in the industry to help try to close some of those gaps that exist. And the last is technology, keeping pace with technology. The Excel spreadsheet has always been and will be king in the retail sector. So uh, we prepare them for those those basic tech skills, but AI and and other such advances continue to roar down the highway at us. Fashion has really taken on AI at a more rapid pace than many industries. So this fall, we're already starting to see a lot of uh, merging that into our curriculum, both in foundational courses, like our writing course, we'll start to teach um, prompt engineering, critical thinking courses, talking about ethics and AI, uh, and then, of course, looking at generative AI and how that impacts the industry. We're running workshops this fall on uh, AI and marketing, AI and supply chain management. It's just going to have a huge impact on the industry. So keeping pace with technology is our third tent pole there for the curriculum. Yeah, it's actually pretty amazing the way the AI picture uh, programs work, the artificial intelligence uh, gener- generative uh, pictures where you could put in a, a, a you know, picture of a shirt and say, give me 50 versions of this with stripes and squares and then we'll spit it out. And you go, oh, I'll just design that. You wonder what kind of impact and speed that can have to the industry to change, right? To change its output. Yes, precisely. It'll be a really interesting rub against the sustainability efforts because the industry is trying to pull away from fast fashion, but AI keeps wanting to push that way. So it'll be an interesting rub. Well, there you have it, everybody. Um, we're going to ask uh, Ron and Scott to come back for a little mini episode just for our subscribers in a moment, but I want to outro them in the appropriate way. Gentlemen, you have Ron Marshall. You have Dr. Scott Carnes, president and provost, respectively, of LIM College. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having us. It's been our pleasure. All right, everybody. You've just ed upped. Higher education is evolving. And if you're in marketing and enrollment management, then you need to be at the Insights EDU conference. That's a fact. That's a fact. Insights EDU 2025 is happening February 12 through 14 in New Orleans, Louisiana. This is your chance to explore the latest trends in higher education and discover new and innovative strategies to level up your program marketing and enrollment. Hear from some of the best speakers in the industry, from companies like Google, LinkedIn, Adobe, and more. Registration is now open, so secure your spot while early bird pricing is still available. Hey, everybody. This is Elvin Freitas, co-founder of the Edup Experience. Did you enjoy that conversation? I hope you did. Did you know that you can actually hear this conversation early on and ad-free? And you can also hear extended episodes, bonus episodes, original content. That's right, original content and invites to special events, all while hoping to sustain Edup. Did you know that? Well, if you didn't know, now you know. To become a subscriber, go to edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com to subscribe to our free email newsletter to learn how you can get access. Again, that's edupexperience.com. That's E-D-U-P experience.com.